Oh, that was amazing. All right, good stuff. Hi, everybody. How are you? So what are we doing? Well, it's 1440. Let's just call it, you know, I've still got, that says I've got 43 minutes. I think we disagree. We're on a different page here. 1440. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Ah, uh, I got the, got the good food. Um, look, as always, I want to start with a photo. Is that okay? Can we do that? Okay, good. Okay, just pretend like you're happy. I just want to get a photo. I'm just going to get one photo. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Oh, my God. Say open source. Open source. And one more time. Yes, good. Thank you. Very, very good. I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate the photo. Like I always say, I'm going to take a cue from my friend Chris Richardson. I'm going to take that photo. I'm going to show it to my daughter, and I'm going to say, see, they listen to me. It's going to be amazing. I appreciate you all being here. It's an amazing opportunity to be here. My name is Josh Long. I work on the spring team. Look, friends, uh, that's a, it's a, you can't even see that. How can you see that? Well, it's, uh, I don't know how to make that brighter. Is there a way to turn off the spotlight on the screen, maybe? I feel like that's the worst place to have a spotlight on the screen, you know? Imagine seeing the Avengers and there's a spotlight on the screen. Okay, well, whatever. If they don't want you to see it, that's... Interesting. My name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring Team. I'm a Spring Developer Advocate, a Kotlin Google Developer Expert, a Java Champion, and most importantly, my friends, I'm at your service. I'm very online. So if you have questions, comments, feedback, whatever, you can find me on the internet. Uh, I, have a, I have a YouTube channel. It's not great. It's, it's okay. It's like, it's a thing you could do if you have nothing else to do. Find me there. Lots of, lots of stuff. I've got like a Twitter account. I'm on Mastodon in case, the, in case the bird website burns down, right? I've got like lots of things where you can find me uh, there. But here today, friends, we're going to talk about Spring Boot 3X, this new generation of Spring uh, Boot, the 3.1 version of which just dropped last night when we were mostly asleep. I'm sure some of you are out there enjoying the sangria, but basically... It came out last night. It came out this morning, but it, was, it came out in the west, further west from here, yesterday, right? Uh, and, and that's amazing. That means it's here for all of us to use, which totally didn't affect my demo in any way. I was prepared. That's good. So what we're going to do, my friends, is we're going to, as always, we're going to go to my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place on the internet, obviously, is production. I love Production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It is better than Disneyland. But if you haven't been to production, you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. Now, friends, we're going to build a new application. As always, we're going to use the newly defaulted 3.1. Uh, I'm going to create a group ID called Bootyful, and I'm going to call this service. If you saw me in the keynote, you know that I'm just really great with names, and there's a reason for that. Um, we, have a, we have a choice about what version of Java we want to use. Friends, uh, you know, again, it's just really worth re restating that while this might seem like you have four radio boxes, you've only really got two choices. Java 17 is required to use Spring Boot 3.x and later, so therefore it's the only reasonable choice to start with, okay? You can use anything later, and really, in less than six months, Project Loom and Java 21, all this stuff will be here. So you should be building your code with an eye towards being able to adapt that. Okay, so this is no, in no way, no situation, in no context ever acceptable. You should never choose Java's 8 or 11. Not even to be ironic, to show people that you make poor life decisions. Never choose those things. Never. Remember, Java 8 is morally inferior and technically inferior to Java 17 and later. It is, Java 17 and later are technically superior. They're faster, more performant, more robust, more syntax-rich, more operations-friendly, more capable in every single way. They're also morally superior. You won't like the look of sadness and despair in your children's eyes when they find out you're using Java 8 in production. <laughs> Don't do this. Be the change you want to see in the world. Use the new versions of Java. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Very good. Look at that. Can we get rid of that? Uh, there's a spotlight. Can we turn off that spotlight? On? I, I mean, I don't need to be seen. I just want them to see the screen. It feels weird. Okay. Anyway, so we, we're going to go ahead and build a new application, my friends. We're going to add some dependencies. We're going to add the GraalVM native image support. We're going to add the Spring Boot web support. We're going to add Postgres. We're going to add the test container support. We're going to add the data JDBC uh, uh, support, right? You could use JPA if you make terrible life decisions, but I'm going to go ahead and use JDBC. Um, we are, I think that's it. I think that's all that we need. We, oh, do we have the actuator? Ah, yes. Much, yes. There you go. Thank you. There we go. 
much better. So you can see the screen, which is important, although I am not looking forward to the, like a, a little bit in the future when I turn over to IntelliJ and it's in light mode. Um, it's, not, it's not gonna be great for all of you in the front. Uh, okay, so I think I'm happy with all those decisions. Um, and by the way, again, Java 17, it's really good. Judging purely by the version number alone, it's more than twice as good as Java 8, right? More than twice as good. So obviously, lots of reasons to use it. Uh, I'm happy with these decisions. Uh, actuator, JDBC, uh, test containers, Postgres, web, GraalVM. Let's do this, let's go, okay? So first thing first, we're gonna open this up in our IDE, and it doesn't ma matter which IDE, right? So here we are. First things first, I wanna take advantage of the new test container support, right? We, we demonstrated this in the keynote. Wow, so bright. Um, we want to take advantage of the new test container support that just, we just announced and integrated into Spring Boot 3.1 yesterday. And we're going to build an application, you know, a stock standard application. Let's just get this out of the way, right out of the, right out of the way uh, up front, okay? So uh, an application that talks to a database. Uh, and, you know, again, this is a nice feature in the new versions of Java, so I'm going to just take advantage of that. I love this feature so much, okay? We're going to build a repository that persists data in the database using this uh, this record, so I'll use the Spring Data CRUD repository, very good. Uh, I'm gonna build a simple customer HTTP controller uh, that'll read and write from that database, right? Customer repository. Uh, we're gonna in, you know, inject that into the constructor because remember, every time you use at auto wired on a field and you do field injection, a unit test dies every single time. Don't do this, don't do this. Be the right, do the right thing, okay? So response body, very good. And friends, we're also gonna create a simple HTTP endpoint called customers. Iterable of customer, customers, return this.repository.findall. Very good. Now again, we're gonna to wanna to talk to a database, okay? And I've got Postgres on the class path. So if I go here, you can see uh, Postgres right there. I've got that, I've got the test container support. So I wanna use this new test container support, but I wanna keep that test code, guess where, in the test context. So I'm gonna create a new test service application. Okay, test service application. Uh, and it's just gonna be another public static void main, right? Public static void main, string args. Uh, and we're gonna say spring application. We're gonna delegate to the main one, to the actual main production code, but we're gonna augment the configuration to include this class and then to run as normal. And the reason we wanna do that is because we're gonna make this a configuration class. And in there, we're gonna define a test container that we can draw credentials from, right? We have a new feature in Spring Boot 3.1 that allows you to source credentials for usernames and passwords from either a Docker Compose or a test container instance or something like that, okay? So we're just gonna let Spring Boot define the bean and then it'll automatically provide a service connection so long as we annotate it thusly. Now I also wanna be able to move very quickly when I'm developing and so to that end, I'm gonna also enable Dev tools. I don't think I actually added that back here in start.spring, oh, did I? Dev tools, let's add that as well, copy and paste. Okay, and then we're gonna paste that in here. Uh, and before we reload it, we're gonna make this test implementation, okay? So command shift F9, uh, or command shift I to re reload the Gradle uh, build. We've got our test service application, and now that that's test implementation, I can use the restart scope annotation. What that will do is it'll tell DevTools, when you reload the context, uh, don't recreate this test container, right? We don't need to, it's okay if that endures for the lifetime of the application. So let's go ahead and start this test main method, okay? Run that. And we've got dev tools, we've got this test container. It'll take a, a little while to start up. You can see it's actually starting up in my main method. It's starting up the connection. You can see it connecting uh, to the test container uh, Postgres instance on, on my local Docker uh, daemon. Uh, it's up and running. It took a little while to start up. It's not it's super fast when you have test containers and Docker and all that stuff in the background. But now I'm using dev tools, right? So I can go here uh, and I can say, okay, git mapping uh, customers maybe add another uh, uh, query here, so customers, right, customers uh, by name, right, path variable string name, uh, and I'll return this, return this dot custom repository, and here again, I'm gonna let the IDE, this wonderful idea of mine, uh, do the work, right, I'm gonna pass in the name, and I'm gonna just hit alt enter, and I'll have it create the query for me automatically, isn't that nice? So I don't have to actually do anything special to make that work, I'm just gonna do command shift F9, that's this thing right here, Command Shift F9 that recompiles the application and DevTools kicks in and it, it's, it, you know, it started the application in 0.3 seconds, right? So very, very fast, long enough that uh, I don't really have to worry about uh, stuff working. Okay, now it's saying, hey, your SQL 
database table doesn't exist, okay? Fair enough, so let's go back here, and we're gonna go ahead and create a source main resources schema file, so let's delete that, create a new file called schema.sql, create table uh, customer, or create table if not exists, customer, because it'll be reloaded, right? ID serial, primary key, name, var, car, or better yet, text. Somebody came up to me uh, after the keynote the other day and said, no, just use text, what are you doing? This var, car business is weird. Okay, fair enough. So, um, we'll, we'll do a, a schema, we'll do some data.sql, uh, delete from customer. We're gonna insert some names into the, uh, into the database, okay? So, uh, some names, and I think, you know, Sanderson was nice enough to put, I'm fixing it, buddy, I, I'm fixing it, I, I see you, okay? So, there we go. We're gonna take all these, we're gonna put those nice names in this list. So, what do we got here? We got Spring, we've got uh, Becca, we've got Andreu, Okay, we've got Luis, uh, we've got uh, uh, Spring, oops, Spring IO. Okay, good, fantastic. So there's our names, okay? Uh, and um, we need to tell Spring Boot to automatically load that SQL file, right? So I'm gonna say SQL init equals always, because from the perspective of Spring Boot, even though it's running in a Docker container that Spring Boot started, it's not embedded in the sense that H2 or something like that is embedded. So let's go ahead and restart it, and again, it's just gonna recompile, and you see it, it's restarted already in 0.263 seconds, right? So we go here, refresh, there's the data, but it didn't give us anything back, and that's, the real question is, why? So we've got uh, data.sql, schema.sql, I feel like, did I miss something here? Oh, why, oh, okay, well, you know, subconsciously, maybe that's what I wanted. Let me see, let's just add Josh. Command shift F9, fix it. And also that had the benefit of making it a nice round number. Look, it's eight. Eight divided by two is still two, and then divided by two again, still two, great. Okay, <laughs> there we are, there we go. Nice round number, there we are, it worked. Of course it worked, it was a demo. Now friends, <laughs> our friends, I don't, I mean, this is all s simple stuff. You've seen this before. We've got our developer, uh, you know, we've got our, our, our groove going on. We're really moving quickly here, thanks to the dev experience that the uh, 3.1 has given us. But I wanna make this code more production worthy. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce some basic validation. So maybe I'll say, okay, I want the name to start with a capital letter, okay? So, so character is uppercase, uh, and I'll just say the name must start with a capital, capital Letter, okay? Very simple. Now what's gonna happen if I have an uppercase letter? It's gonna say, uh, if, I don't have, if I don't have an uppercase letter, it's gonna throw in a legal state exception, and I wanna make sure that I handle that error somehow, okay? And the most reasonable way to sort of centralize error handling is to build a controller advice, and then I'll have, you know, error handling uh, controller advice. Here we are, advice. And we're gonna create an exception handler that listens for this exception, and we're gonna then respond to it and handle it in some way, okay? So, what I wanna do is I wanna return an error that gets represented to the client. I don't wanna just give them an ugly stack trace, that's no way to run a railroad, we need to do better. But friends, and this is a hypothetical, I've only heard about this on the internet, I, I've never seen it in practice, but it is theoretically possible in the same way that the Higgs boson particle was for a long time considered theoretically possible, it is theoretically possible that there are people writing applications intended for a production environment not using the JVM in Spring. I've never seen it, again, it's a weird thing, but in that situation, in that situation, it would behoove you to have a standardized, consistent way of representing errors, and to that end, there's an RFC called the Problem Details uh, RFC. It's uh, RFC 7807, you can see that right there in the URL, very front and center, or right there buried in the you know, request for comments 7807. It's a small, nice little API, and so I'm gonna take advantage of that new support in Spring Framework 6 to ret return a problem detail, say problem detail for status, status.badrequest.value, and you know, I'll say set detail, ise.get localized message, okay, great, and I'll return this, okay? So there's my, my new error handling logic. Let's go ahead and restart this, uh, and we're going to make a request here, okay? Let me see, here we are, here we are, here we are. Curl, HTTP, localhost, 8080, forward slash customers, capital letter Josh, I get the response, okay? Great, it's fine. Now, if I go to lowercase Josh, I get a nice, consistent RFC 7807 compliant endpoint. Okay, small stuff, but nice, moving on. Okay, now I've got this endpoint, 
uh, and I'm looking at the errors, well, you know what, maybe I wanna inject some context associated with the current request. And to that end, you know, I've, I've long been able to do this. I can inject the HTTP servlet request. I can say, okay, give me all the servlet headers and all that stuff, I don't know, whatever. I wanna do something like that. It's not all that important. What is important here, friends, is this type itself. You see, this type is our friend. We've known it for many years, 20 plus odd years. And yet something has changed about it. Something very important here has changed. You may have noticed this. It's got a new package. Now, this package is not great news, yet it's also really great news, okay? What this is, is there was a time more than five years ago, before the COVID virus, BC, uh, where, <laughs> where, where, or, there was a, yeah, yeah. There was a time, uh, BC, uh, where Oracle just sort of stopped responding to emails. Just overnight, they ghosted the community. And as a result, nothing could be done. Because in order for J Java EE to move forward, Oracle has to ratify these changes, right? They were the leads of several different specifications. They had to approve of certain changes that were being done in the Java EE specifications. And if they stopped responding to email, then that meant the whole community process just came to a crashing halt. Right? This is not good for anybody. This is why in order to be truly open, you need to be open source. So after about six months or something like that, eventually Oracle was able to come back to the, the, to the table and they, they agreed to open source Java EE. But Oracle being Oracle, uh, they insisted that all changes, be it to a new type, a new, uh, new uh, interface, any changes to the method names, any deletions, additions, etc., all of that had to be in a new package. So this is a political problem for which we could, you know, that we could only begin to address technically. Now, to their credit, the Eclipse Foundation has done an amazing job. Really, amazing job. They took this problem that they were sort of left with and did a great job. They released Java, there was Java EE7, then the Eclipse Foundation released Jakarta EE7, which is basically exactly the same as Java EE7. They released Jakarta EE8, I mean, which was the same as J Java EE7. No changes at all, same, just new license, new documentation, new tests, but basically the same exact API, so backwards compatible. Then they did J Jakarta EE9, which was the same as 8, except they moved the package from Javax to Jakarta. Now, what does this mean for you? Hopefully nothing. Unless you're using one of these APIs that has Javax in it, like JPA or JMS or Bean validation, uh, then yeah, you're gonna have the worst find and replace of your life, okay? But even there, it's not that bad, right? And once you've done this, once you've made the jump to these new Jakarta types, we're in a position where now these, these types, these APIs, can finally, finally grow and change and evolve. They haven't moved very much in more than half a decade, right? This is slow. This is not, this is not what we want when we move uh, at the speed of business. So I'm very happy that this has happened, but one of the big features in Spring Boot 3 is that we've integrated all these types for you, okay? It took a lot of time. It took a lot of time, you can just imagine. We took the uh, Spring Boot code base, we added the new Jakarta EE types, removed the old Java EE types, and then compiler errors everywhere, right? And a lot of what we had to do was to work with the community to make sure all those types and all those things were up to date and working as they should, including Apache Tomcat, which is a project to which the uh, Spring, Spring, you know, VMware and, and so on contribute a lot. Uh, so okay, good, now we've got these new types. Good, you, hopefully you don't notice it, but if you do, now you know what happened. It's not an illusion, just find and replace your way out of it, no problem. So we've got our observer, we've got our application, we've got good error handling. I wanna uh, introduce a little bit of observability. Observability is a very simple idea. I wanna understand what the application is doing by looking at its outputs, right? I, my application, once it's in production, it's all alone, and it needs, it, we need to know it's okay out there, right? And what, the one way to do this is to do observability. Now, historically, the way you did observability was you created, uh, you had Micrometer, right, which sat at the bottom of the stack, uh, and we created Micrometer before Spring Boot 2.0, uh, you know, back in 2017, and Spring Framework depends on that, and then you had Spring Boot, which depends on Spring Framework, and then you have Spring Cloud, which de depends on Spring, uh, Spring Boot, and then you had Spring Cloud Sleuth for distributed tracing. So this did metrics, and then that did tracing, and the problem was, of course, that you couldn't have distributed tracing down here in the framework because it would create a circular dependency. So what we've done in Spring Boot 3 is we've moved distributed tracing support and the metrics down into Micron and now everything above that benefits from that. Going even further, we have this nice new uh, observation API, okay? So I'm gonna do an observation. I'll say I wanna create a metric by name, right? Uh, and I'm gonna, in order to do this, I'm going to inject a observation registry like this. Okay, and I'm gonna add that to the constructor. Thank you, IntelliJ. Uh, this dot registry 
observe new supplier. Here we are, okay? And I'm just gonna do the thing that I was doing before, except I'm gonna do it within the context of this, uh, of this um, uh, supplier, this lambda, right? Customer repository, please, find by name. Okay, name, passing that in. And this can, of course, boil it down into a nice little lambda. Very good, get rid of that. So what I've done is I've, I've done two things. I've created a metric that's gonna be incremented every single time this code gets run. And I've created a little lambda, a context, in which uh, if I'm doing distributed tracing, if I've got requests coming in from uh, another service that has initiated distributed tracing, it'll automatically get propagated. Or if I'm doing distributed tracing and I'm talking to a service uh, to which I can send distributed tracing headers, uh, then this will automatically initiate and then send those out as well. In this case, I'm just talking to my local SQL database, but if I were talking to another microservice or something, if I'm using a service here to call another API, another uh, you know, Kafka or an HTTP endpoint or something, that would be a natural place to have distributed tracing headers. And now you might be saying, to what uh, in, you know, observability systems can I integrate? With which can I integrate? And you know, that's a great question. There's a lot of good options here. There's App Optics, Azure Monitor, Open Telemetry Protocol for uh, you know, both distributed tracing and metrics. You've got Prometheus, you've got uh, you know, all sorts of stuff here, right? Lots of good stuff. I won't give you the whole exhaustive list. It's just nice to know you've got this new unified thing. Now obviously, this is uh, metrics and so on. It's part of the actuator. So I'm gonna show, I'm gonna say I wanna use all the, uh, all the HTTP endpoints, okay? I wanna show the probes, uh, probes for, for my Kubernetes uh, health endpoint. I also wanna have the um, details, okay? So I'll say show details always for the health endpoint. Hit Command, Shift, F9, reload, all the way down here. Where are you? Did you finish already? Okay, let's just assume it did. Customers, great. Actuator, great. Uh, um, go to this endpoint, refresh, 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 refresh. Go here, go to metrics, and you can see it says by name. And I can go here now, by name, and there's the count of the requests that I've made, how many have been re you know, requested, the total time, and so on. And again, this is just on my local machine, but I can forward these to another uh, time series database, like the ones that I just, limited, uh, I just listed in micrometer.io. Okay, friends, we've got our observable, error handling, easily tested, dev, you know, test containers friendly, uh, application. I think it's now a good time to think about how we get this thing to production. And the first thing that people ask when we talk about this is, hey, like, I, I want to use, uh, I want to turn this into a Docker image. Well, naturally, there is a way you can do that. You can use build packs, right? Docker images, uh, build packs are a great way to build a OCI image or a container out of your application artifact. Remember, friends, friends don't let friends write Docker files. That's a fact, that's a fact, friends. Don't do it. So use build packs. It's a great way to take an application artifact, be it a, a, a .jar or .war uh, or a Ruby on Rails app or a Python app or a, a Node.js application or a P, hey, hey. P, hey, 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 hey. P, hey, hey, I can't say it, it's not a language. I refuse. Anyway, it, you can take all those things and build an OCI artifact very easily using the PAC CLI. Obviously, this is not a new thing. This has been in Spring Boot for years. Uh, it's just a very nice thing to know about. And also, there are build commands on the command line. If you're using Maven, you can do Maven W Spring Boot colon build hyphen image, right? Uh, and that ma Maven W, okay? There's the Maven equivalent of it. And then in, in, in the Gradle, you'd say Gradle W uh, build boot image, right? Same thing. I'm not going to spend time wasting, uh, waiting around for that thing to finish. We don't have time, but it's a thing you can do. It's very easy. You can then, then Docker tag and Docker push uh, your application to uh, whatever container registry you like. The next thing, my friends, that we have to care about is how to make this application and package it up in such a way that it's as efficient and scalable as possible. And here, friends, it's important to take a brief moment to register, to observe that, frankly, Java is really, really amazing, right? It's a very scalable, efficient language. So which programming language used the least electricity, right? This is from 2018. That's five years ago, friends. Uh, and there's a, a great table here, normalized global energy results for energy, time, and memory. And if you look at this, you can see that C is number one, C. It's 1.0. Rust is doing pretty great there. C++, a little bit worse, but still very good. Ada, but who cares? And then Java, right? <laughs> and then Java. Now Java, let's just round up, my friends. Let's just round up, and we're gonna say it's 2.0, okay? We're gonna say it's twice as inefficient as C. It's still in the top five. Doing great. And like, compare the other languages in this list. Like, for example, C Sharp, coming in ahead of Go, right? Here's, okay, this one I do not understand. I thought TypeScript was JavaScript. I thought this 
compiled to that. How did we go from here to here? I don't understand this at all. Uh, whatever. Anyway, moving on. Uh, there's also this, you know, monstrosities. Um, I have no idea. Oh, whatever. And this one hurts me to think about. This is Python. I love Python. I love it. This is powering the AI revolution. Take that, chat GBT. But look, what is going on there? That's almost 33 times more inefficient than Java. So when people say Java is like inefficient, I think maybe they need to just check their notes, right? It's very, very efficient. And there's two reasons it's efficient and uh, you know, scalable. One, of course, is the Java garbage collector. Although I want to say, I just want to register that I don't think the Java programming language has the ability to claim that it is the first Java garbage collector. That honor might actually go to uh, uh, this person, who's a product manager from uh, in New York at a company, and she is from the island of Java, Indonesia. She is a Java garbage collector, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 let's just, let, yeah, absolutely. And what I love about this tweet, my friends, what I love about this is, look, <laughs> that means that there are almost 20,000 human beings on the planet that sit at the intersection of, you know, Indo Indonesia, the Java programming language, and, and garbage collection. The, the Venn diagram there is very small, and yet, here we are. That's all of them. I love the internet sometimes. Okay, great. So the Java programming language garbage collector is a miracle of technology, right? Amazing. It allows me to write, you know, sometimes uh, regrettable code and still get pretty great performance. Thank you, Java. The next thing that makes Java so scalable is the just-in-time compiler. The just-in-time compiler uh, is a thing that looks at your code and where it can be sure that you're not going to introduce any new types into the runtime take that code and compile it into a operating system and architecture-specific native image. And this just-in-time compiler has been there for a long time, but not since the beginning. It actually came a little bit later. You see, we in the Java community, for a while, we had the distinction of being an interpreted language that had a compiler, right? Like most interpreted languages, you give it the source code and it runs it. But we had a compiler and we still didn't get native speeds. So this just-in-time compiler, I felt like it was a really good middle ground. Uh, that said, you know, it's an amazing piece of technology. It really is. Large organizations like Alibaba and Google, they take advantage of this. They warm up their services so that they're more prepared for production uh, traffic, and then they loose them on produ production traffic once the just-in-time compiler has kicked in and adaptively compiled certain parts of the program. It's awesome, right? I love the just-in-time compiler. And actually, if you think about it, there's a bit of a thing here. Like, if, it, if it's so good, if it's so good, and yes, we know there's some issues with you know, any dynamic behavior, right? The just-in-time compiler can't do things with reflection and serialization and proxies and things like that. But still, if it's so good, why not just proactively compile the whole application? And you know what? It's a great idea. So good, in fact, that uh, they have a project called GraalVM, okay? Now, GraalVM, the core conceit of it is that it's an open JDK drop-in replacement, about which I'm sure you've heard a fair bit at this very show. Uh, and there's a native image compilation mechanism. Uh, and that native image compilation mechanism can take your code as long as you tell it when you're going to do all these fun, dynamic things, like reflection, like serialization, like proxies, like JNI, like resource loading, uh, etc. And who better than Spring, as a framework, centrally figured in your sort of uh, system to tell the GraalVM compiler about most, if not all, of this dynamic behavior. And so a big thing that we did in Spring Boot 3.x is we introduced this new AOT engine. This new AOT engine is phenomenal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here, and I'm going to kick off a, 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 a GraalVM native compilation. Okay, I'm going to do native compile, right? There's that. I'm going to hit enter. And we're just going to sit back and we're going to let it do its thing. But I'm going to be honest with you here, friends, just straight talk here. This is going to take a minute or two, right? It's going to take a while, and it's gotten a lot better, obviously, but it does take its time. And it's actually kind of frustrating because I have a hard time paying attention. Squirrel, I have a hard time paying attention, right? It's not easy to keep me focused, and especially with this, I get kicked out of the zone, right? And it takes a long enough time that I get kicked out of the zone, but not long enough that I can go do something useful, like respond to emails or, uh, you know, go to the bathroom or make a cup of coffee or take care of other sort of I.O. issues, right? It's just 
long enough to kick me out of the zone, but not long enough to do anything useful. And now I finally, I finally, I'm, I'm in, my, in, in a point in my life where I understand this cartoon. I never understood this before, right? The compiling cartoon from XKCD, one of the best comics ever, the number one program excuse for legitimately slacking off, my code's compiling. Huh? I, I didn't get it before, right? Who is this for? Who's got a programming language that takes long enough that you can get distracted and end up doing this, right? We do. This is us now. This is our life. It's okay, though. The results speak for themselves, but it is a little bit of a problem. We get kicked out of the zone. And so, so frankly, I just sit there with my head in my hands, and I just get distracted. I'm just you know, staring at the ceiling, and frankly, I start to hear elevator music, and this is a problem. The elevator music, you know, it just takes me away, uh, and I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be great if, wouldn't it be great if everybody could hear elevator music? So I asked, and I went to the official GrauVM project at Oracle, I went to the Gravium Project at Oracle and I said, look, I already hear elevator music in my head while I do these sometimes long running compilations. I just like everybody else to hear it too. Thank you in advance and I appreciate your amazing work. And I do, I really do. Look at, and look at, there's other people that appreciate it as well, I think. And we got some great responses, right? Some great responses, uh, including this one from one of our friends over at Red Hat, right? Uh, uh, Andrew Din, he's a distinguished engineer on the Java team at Red Hat. Uh, you know, and he has this great response. Uh, he has this great video. I'm not going to play it, but basically this is from the... Do you remember there was a movie called GoldenEye? That was a James Bond movie in the 90s with Pierce Brosnan. Then they did a video game. And then this is from the soundtrack for the video game for the movie, okay? And it's actually really good elevator music. I think this is what we needed. This sounds pretty good to me. Somebody else said that they thought, they thought that, uh, they, they said, I would add that using beeps in general, not only for native image, really helped me reduce the development time. Yeah, my freaking toaster can make a ding sound why can't my multi-million line compiler? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Let's do this. That, that's a, a step in the right direction. I couldn't agree more. Good stuff, okay? I, I'm already on board. I'm with this, uh, this suggestion right here. And then I got a wonderful response from this gentleman, Fabio Niepaus. He's a researcher on the Gravium team at Oracle Labs, right? Uh, and he said, Thank you for your feature request. Oh, oh, oh. He said, thank you for your feature request, Josh. The problem with playing music during the compilation process is that it's just fixing the symptoms, and we've been and are still working on the cause, making Gravium native image more efficient in terms of time, memory, and CPU consumption. Good, so far, okay. Anyway, he says, I have prototyped a dash dash Josh Long <laughs> mode. And, So, so basically, you would do, uh, uh, you do native image dash dash Josh Long mode, right? And then you'd get this. <laughs> and it would play music. Yes, yes, please. This is the future I want to live in. But, he continues, for some reason, I have the feeling that my PR will be rejected, probably because of the copyrighted music. Aww. <sighs> On a more serious note, yeah, we could add a dash dash ring bell when done option that prints the bell code after the compilation process. Okay, fine. It's a step in the right direction. I'll take it. <sighs> anyway, where were we? Oh yeah, the compilation, I forgot about that. Right, oh yeah, that completed minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so, native compile, service, there we go. It's gonna fail because it's, well first of all, I think I'm already running it. Yeah, I'm already running it on the local machine here. So let's stop this. 
Uh, and then the second problem is, remember, we don't have any properties telling it which database to connect to. That's all implied by the uh, test container support uh, at runtime. So I need to run it with some environment variables telling it where to talk to uh, my database. So I'm going to use talk run.sh. That's the script. I'm exporting spring data source URL, spring data source password, username, etc. I'm going to do docker compose up. Uh, oh, sorry. CD desktop talk docker compose up. Oh, here we are. It's going to spin up a Postgres instance, and then I'm going to do run. That's going to connect. It's going to run the application. And there you go. You can see it spun up in whatever, uh, you know, a little bit more than a tenth of a second. That's pretty good. The, this is good, but it's great for serverless. You can do like AWS Lambda and all this kind of stuff with GraalVM and Spring Cloud Function. I, I'm a big fan. But what's much more interesting to me is this. This is the process identifier, 71. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask it for some memory. So PSR, RSS, 71. And it's saying it's taking about 106 megabytes of RAM. Now, I don't know how much memory your applications are taking, but I'm willing to bet it's a little more than that. Show, show of hands if it's more than that. Yeah, the rest of you are lying. Yeah, it's totally taking more than that. And I went to a data center like 20 years ago. Anybody here remember data centers? They were, cold, they were big, cold buildings with computers in cages. Uh, and you'd, you'd go in and with a jacket, because they kept the air conditioning on, and you'd plug in these patch cables, and you'd talk to different machines, and you'd say, hey, how you doing? How much RAM are you running? What are you, what's going on? And I would, I, back then, there was a time when application servers roamed the earth, and so we had applications deployed within application servers, but multi-tenancy with an application server was never a thing. It never really worked. So we had one application in one application server, and it took, oh, you know, two gigs of RAM. And that was 20 years ago, and that was on 32-bit machines. And I remember at the time thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be great if I could have like more RAM, you know, just so I could really, you know, see what happens. Uh, and now, if you had told me then, 20 years ago, that 20 years later, I'd be running an application in 1 20th of the RAM footprint, as I was then, I don't think I would have believed you. But here we are. What a wonderful time to be alive. All right, friends, so we've got our application. It's a service. Let's build a client. We're going to go back here. I'm also really great with this part of the naming, so I'm going to call it a client, right? Uh, we're going to use the GraphQL support. We're going to use uh, the reactive web support. And we're just going to go ahead and hit generate using the latest and greatest version of Java here. Uh, downloads UAO client.zip. Open this up. And what we want to do is we want to build an application that talks to the service that we just built. Okay? Now, I'm going to build this application. Um, and, you know, I, you know, what I want to do is I want to build a client to it, right? And, you know, you can imagine what we need to do. So customer, HTTP, uh, HTTP, capital C, okay? I could do that, and then I would just inject the reactive web client. I guess I could do this, that kind of thing. That's fine as well. And, you know, you can kind of understand what we need to do, but uh, this looks suspiciously like work. So I am not going to do this. Instead, I'm going to take advantage of the new declarative HTTP interfaces. So customer, HTTP client, I'll have an endpoint here, a method rather, uh, that'll return all the results in a reactive stream. Uh, and I'm gonna use the type from the server side. I want the same type, right? So I'm gonna do something right now, something terrible, something that you should never ever do, ever. Not even when you're all by yourself at home and no one is looking. I am gonna copy and paste code. So <laughs> here's my service application. We're gonna Take that type right there, command C. Okay, go back over here, paste it. Good, look at that, very good. Get rid of that, get rid of that. Good, okay, so customer, all, okay? So I'm gonna, that's a method to return all of the records by calling customers. I'm gonna return by name, so this will take a string, string name, right? There we go, very good. And now I want to define how Spring is supposed to map these method calls to the network call. So I'm going to use this new client side annotation called git exchange, right? Uh, and I'll use that here. I'll say when somebody calls uh, the method by name on an implementation of this interface, make a network call to whatever host and port we configure, forward slash customers, forward slash name. So I'll go here, I'll create a bean. And what I want to do, let's just, let's just start off with what we want to do, right? We're going to say return new application runner. And I'm going to inject this customer repository, or this customer client, rather, uh, in here. I'll say cc.all.subscribe, and I'll just print out the results like so, OK? Um, and uh, we'll just, uh, come on, off. Uh, nope, 
That was not even close. There we are, okay? So that's the thing I wanna do. In order to support that, I need to have a instance of that de de you know, declarative interface. So in order to do that, I need to do uh, some configuration. Now, most of this you can do just once per application and reuse, but as I've only got one interface, I'll just do it all in one place, okay? So wc equals builder.baseurl, HTTP, localhost, 8080, Okay, dot build var wca, which is a web client adapter. We're gonna tell it how to can, you know, talk to an HTTP client. Okay, uh, I think I can do a bit, nope, that's, that's it. And then we're gonna build the actual proxy exact, itself using the HTTP service proxy factory. Uh, build that, uh, create the client, customer client dot class, and we're gonna use the adapter, so the client adapter wca, okay? So we're saying build this interface definition using that HTTP client uh, and uh, the, you know, as configured here, and then we're gonna inject it. So let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. It worked. Of course it worked, okay? Now, moving on. We have a simple way to talk to the service. We can add as many of these interfaces as we, as we like. I'm using uh, HTTP, but obviously you've probably heard by now, we also support our socket, which is a really fast binary protocol for working with network services. And uh, we support, you know, we, it's a flexible mechanism. So in theory, we could support other things like GraphQL. I think there's probably work being done on that. We could ask Rossin, uh, he's probably around somewhere. Uh, we could do that, right? Good. This is great if you want to talk to the service and get the data, but you still need to return that data and represent it uh, to the client. One way to do that would be to use Spring Cloud Gateway as a proxy, right? Uh, and that's a great thing if you want to act on the envelope. But in this case, what I want to do is I want to act on the payload itself, okay? And there's a bit of a tension here, right? What happens if you're wandering through the Sahara Desert and you've got 1% battery and you've got like 1G signal and you've got, you know, uh, an app that is gonna make 10 different calls <clears throat> to 10 different microservices. Not great. You're gonna lose that battery before you get help. That's not good, right? So what we want is some way to be as efficient as possible. Clients, and by clients I mean your iPhone, your Android, your PlayStation, your Xbox, your cars, all those things, they have uh, their own SDKs and, and they, want to be, they want all the data as efficiently and in, and in one, one fell swoop as possible, right? They want it all at the same time. But microservices and services in general tend to be well-structured, isolated, singly focused things. That's the goal anyway. And so there's a bit of a tension, a, a mismatch, right, between what we want as a client developer and what we want as an API developer. So we can use something like what we're building here as an edge service to account for, to build endpoints to serve the use cases of the client. And so I want a, I want a way to stand up an endpoint that gives the client as much or as little data as it needs and no more. And to this end, I think GraphQL is a great fit. So we've got Spring GraphQL in the class path. I'm gonna add a GraphQL uh, file here, schema.graphqls, uh, and we're gonna define some uh, GraphQL endpoints. Now, in GraphQL, there's only three verbs, okay? Three verbs. Uh, we've got query for reading data, you've got mutations for changing data, and you've got subscriptions for reading data over time, things where you might use WebSockets or things like that. Queries are great, okay? So we can say, uh, I wanna ask a question, type query. This is gonna be a well-known type called query, and it's gonna have a field uh, called customers that's gonna return an array of customers, okay? Uh, type customer. And the type customer has an ID and it has a name field. And right now, this looks more or less one-to-one -one like what we're doing in our Java code, right? So this is a well-known type. This is a new type. Uh, and GraphQL is gonna automatically make this field available when somebody asks GraphQL what fields are, you know, what queries are supported. Now we need to actually implement this query, this, this, this field, to return the data that, that looks like this. So let's do that. We're gonna create a new controller here, okay, at controller, class customer GraphQL controller, okay, and we're gonna say private final customer HTTP client CC, uh, and we could say schema mapping type name equals query, field equals customers, and then return all of the customers, right, like this. The, the thing is, like I said, it's re queries are a special case. They get done a lot, they're a well-known kind of thing. They get done a lot, and so actually there is a convenience annotation, a meta annotation, called query mapping, which is defaulted to the type name of query, and the field is derived from the name of the method. So this is gonna call, the customer client is gonna make an HTTP request to our service, and it's gonna return the JSON. Oh, by the way, I have a question. I speak a few other languages. 
I speak English. In English, we might say, Jason. But frankly, I'm of the mind that we should be saying it the French way. More like, Jason, right? <laughs> now, uh, how much better would life be if we could all just do Jison? Who, who wants that in their life? Let's, let's, let's make this a movement. I'm tired of Jason. It just sounds like a very harsh thing to say in polite company. Okay, so we've got our endpoint. We've got our endpoint, okay? Um, it's gonna return the data. I wanna inspect that data. Graphical, true, okay? And we're gonna go ahead and run this application. This is gonna enable a little console that we can use, okay? Localhost 9090 GraphQL, or GraphQL, right? Uh, and we're going to, you know, you can see we've got this nice thing right here, right? Look at this, I've got control space, or sorry, enter, control space, oh, schema. All that work that we had to do to teach HTTP about schema, uh, all those hacks, all those ridiculous arguments around, oh, do I do put or post or, or options and patch? Do I do 200 header or 201 or 202 and a location header? All that goes away. There's only one way to do something like this in GraphQL, and either you did it or you didn't. It works or it doesn't, right? So this is very convenient. I got the ID back. I want also the name, okay? Great, I got the name, okay? Now, what I wanna do here is I wanna actually, what, what if I had another microservice still, okay? What if I had another microservice, uh, and I wanted to get all of the profile data for each customer? So it's another microdata, microservice, uh, and I've got profile data. Let's just imagine, you know, social media data, okay? Like username and password or something like that. Okay, so let's create a new type here. Profile, ID, ID. And now each customer will have a profile like this. Very good, so I'm gonna add a new type, but I'm not gonna change the back end service. I'm just gonna graph it together, you know, with Spring and GraphQL. So I'll create a new schema controller resolver, or uh, you know, field resolver, schema mapping. The type name, of course, is customer. And uh, you know, the field will still be defaulted, so it would be profile, profile. And I, in order to understand which profile to select, I need the, um, the uh, customer, don't I? So I'll say customer.id, there we go, system out customer ID equals customer dot I, name, whatever, who cares, good, okay? So we've got this now new resolver resolving the profile data for each customer. So when I go here and I refresh this page, look at that, if I say profile, I get this, I get that back, and you can see I've got this, but there is a problem here, isn't there, friends? I've just made, whatever, I had eight, eight customers, I think, and now I've just made eight calls to the profile service, right? You can just imagine this is a profile service. That's inefficient. So GraphQL has a great way to batch it, right? I can use batch mapping, and in this context, I say I wanna get all the profiles for all of the customers, and I get a list of customers. And now I can do, you know, if I'm using uh, Spring Data JDBC or MyBetis or Java OQ or something, right? I can do, uh, you know, select all from uh, profile where the Customer ID is in this list of customers, right? So profile, here we are. For var c, customer list, map.put, c, new profile, c.id, return map, okay? Very good, so now we can rewrite this. I'm not gonna change the contract. I'm not gonna change the perspective of what the user gets. I'll just do that. Same exact results, but now I don't have to, I'm not re, uh, requiring that thing. I'm not, I don't have the N plus one problem, right? So GraphQL is a great way to build production-worthy services and endpoints. The declarative client can get, there, get you there really quickly. This is all using Spring Boot 3.1, of course. Uh, so I could have been using dev containers, you know, test containers here if I wanted to, but obviously uh, there's no, th I'm not talking to anything per se. Um, you know, but I, one thing I, I could do, I could uh, native compile, right? I can do that if I want. Uh, and we'll just let that do its thing in the background. And uh, with that, my friends, or you know, maybe not, what did we just do? Build, compile native, oh yeah. Great old W. By the way, do you know, you, do you know if you don't know, you can just ask, like say which tasks, grep uh, native, right? So, oh, whoop, whoop, minus I. <laughs> or not, did I not add this to the, oh I didn't. Oh friends, this one's on me. Here we go, Gravium support. Copy, paste, go here, go here. Great, native compile, right? We'll let that do its thing. In the meantime, my friends, I think we're in a good place. I think we're in a great place. We can, 
I think, we're, I think we've looked at a, a few things in Spring Boot 3.1 that'll make you able to better build more efficient, more production-worthy, more developer-friendly code bases, right? Who learned something new? Good. Who had fun? Good. I really appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>